Hello and welcome to Code Slicing. In this episode, we're going to be using the now playing overlay we created in the last episode. If you missed that, go back and watch it if you want to be brought up to speed. Nothing too complicated going on in this one, but it does give me the opportunity to talk to you about transitions and how to leverage them. So let's get going and I'm going to pretend that I've got a collection of songs that I'm going to represent as coloured rectangles in a grid. You're going to have to use your imagination a bit, but the principles are the same. So let's say, instead of this V stack, we've got 20 items here and we're going to put those in a lazy V grid. Lazy V grid and the columns are actually going to be an array of just one item. And we're going to make that adaptive with a minimum size of 80 and we don't need a maximum on this one. I'm not going to go into detail about grids in this episode, although I can do it in the future if you'd like, but I'll leave a link to a couple of nice resources on the topic in the description. I'm going to use a button for each one of these items because I like the feedback it gives you by default when you click on it. So let's loop through them. Um, items. Button. We'll leave the action blank for now and let's just fill in the label. And this label is going to be a rectangle. And you can see the adaptive layout doing its thing there by filling the horizontal space with four items per row, ensuring a minimum width of 80. But we want to control the height explicitly, so I'm going to say height 120. Lovely. Let's think about the colour for a second, because I want these to be different shades of blue. For that, we're going to adjust the opacity of the blue we're going to be filling them with based on the index. So let's create a constant up here which we'll call the opacity delta per item, which is going to be equal to 1 divided by the number of items as a double. And now we can use that as a fill for our rectangle by saying color blue with an opacity of opacity delta per item plus opacity delta per item times the index as a double. And we start off with an opacity delta per item because we don't want the first item to be fully transparent. We at least want to be able to see it. But there we go, you get the general idea. And this works, by the way, because the opacity modifier there returns a color rather than a view, which means it can be used as a fill style. Now we have our songs in place. We need to set up some state that is going to represent the song being played. For our purposes, this is as simple as an integer representing the currently selected index. And so we can see it in our preview, let's just set that initially to 10 and resume. As part of a fully fledged app, this would most likely be part of the application state in an environment variable somewhere, but I'm going to do it like this so we don't get distracted. And that state we've got there is useless if we don't do anything to change it. So let's flesh out the action closure on that button. First, we check if the index is equal to the now playing index. If it is, we want to set it back to minus one so we can toggle it by clicking on the same rectangle. Else, we set the now playing index to the index. So at this point, the now playing index state will be equal to the index of the selected item. And we need to use that to stick on our shiny new now playing overlay. To do that, we can put the rectangle in a Z stack. And let's set the alignment to bottom leading. And then on top of the rectangle, we add our overlay on the condition that we are currently the now playing index. If index equals now playing, now playing equalizer bars, and we'll give that a frame of 20. We'll also give it some padding, a tiny shadow just to make it stand out even when it's on a lighter background. And since we need to know if we are currently the now playing index twice, let's extract it into its own constant using the techniques that we discussed in the multiple cursors episode. I'm going to make some space with a temporary variable. I'll select the first occurrence, copy it, select next occurrence, control shift click on the T to select that, start typing my variable name is now playing, escape equals paste. If you want to know more about that kind of thing, I recommend watching that episode where I go into a lot more detail. And now that we're a bit more organized, let's play this. And there we are. As we click, it switches to uh, whichever one we click on. But as you can see, it's just appearing and disappearing. So now we need to talk a little bit about transitions. 
Transitions determine how SwiftUI animates the insertion and removal of views into the hierarchy when done within an animation context. By default, the transition is opacity-based, which is why views fade in and out if you don't touch the transition modifier. I actually think the default transition is fine for this, but for the purposes of this tutorial, let's change that to use scaling, like this. Transition, scale. In order for us to see this, we need to make sure that the state is changing as part of an animation. So we can do that by putting the part that changes state inside an animation block. With animation, ease in out. And then we can play it again. Right, so let's see. It scales out, but immediately appears. And this is a problem with the internal simulator, aka the preview. It does not handle transitions properly. So from this point on, I'm going to close down the preview and use the external simulator. There we are, and you can see that it scales up and scales down nicely. And notice how it scales up from the position of the icon, which is why I'm using padding and alignment in this as opposed to offsetting it to that specific location, in which case it would scale up from the center of the frame. One thing to be aware of is that if you're having problems with a view not behaving properly when using transitions, as in this example, where I'm combining the slide with opacity transition, see how it immediately disappears when it's removed? What appears to be happening is that the z-index of the view being removed is reduced and goes below the other view as it's leaving. But you can overcome this problem by fixing the z-index of the conditional view to a positive value, like this. Once you've done that, it works as expected. But how did I get the slide and opacity transition working together in that example? Well, let's do that in R code by adding opacity to our scale transition. And I do actually need to qualify this now because we're going to be calling a function on scale called combined with opacity. So the transition will actually adopt scale and opacity as the method for insertion and removal. Let's see that in action. All right, and we can see that it fades and scales in together. So the only thing left to do is to set that back to minus one and we can rerun it. And there we have it. I'm now playing overlay, looking fantastic, and doing exactly what it should do. Now I happen to think it looks better when just fading in and out, so that's probably what I would do in reality, but I might want to make a custom transition for this, which is entirely possible and the subject of an upcoming tutorial. So if you're not already subscribed, consider doing that because you won't want to miss it, it's going to be brilliant. Don't forget to like the video if you liked it of course, and if you have any questions, comments or suggestions, please leave them below. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me, see you next time.